everyone. Welcome back to Retrocoms. As you can see here, we have got a lot of phones in front of us today. Given that I have a little bit more space, a little extra time, I decided I would take you guys through all of the Motorola devices in my collection. This is going to be kind of a mini-series, if you will. I'll take you through all of the devices I have by each OEM. Motorola being my favorite, they get to go first. I have done decently keeping them in chronological order somewhat, except leaving the Razer series to their own row and keeping smartphones in their own space. So let's start with the oldest phones in my collection, the Motorola bag phones. Take you guys in closer. I apologize for any odd camera angles or noise levels. Still getting used to recording in this new space here. So here is our first bag phone. It has seen some things. This bag is relatively old and is definitely showing its age. If I can find the zippers here. It's quite an odd design. Of course, not quite as familiar with these bag phones. This was not a phone that I've personally used. Was not even born when this thing would have been in use. So, not the most knowledgeable. Here it is. I believe that this is operational to an extent. If I were to plug this into a car's 12 volt port, it would power up this device. However, it operates on an analog signal that is no longer in use. Similar story for this one. Opening it up, its bag is in much better condition. Only problem with this device is its antenna is missing part of its plastic sheath. I believe it would still be functional as an antenna if the signals that it required were still in use. However, it is a bit unsightly. That is quite unfortunate. It's sad to see these old phones degrading, so um, we'll talk more about similar things as I go through my collection, but as the phones age, certain components do tend to wear and crack, such as this plastic here. Moving on, here is a Motorola America series. Now, I don't have much info on this device. I know it is a relative of the MicroTac family, but I do not have a whole lot of data on this one. Couldn't find much online, but it does still work when power is put to it. Its battery no longer holds a charge. You'll see that's a common theme among phones of this age as time has progressed. The older the phones are, the more likely they are to suffer from battery degradation. Here is a Motorola Teletac. Similar story here. Sadly, part of its antenna has broken, but otherwise it is in decent shape. Moving along, we have a Motorola MicroTac Lite XL. I don't have the original MicroTac here, but these are interesting little devices. As we see a more modern design language start to come to shape, drawing inspiration from the older Teletac, but a welcome change from the bag phone platforms. Next to it, we have another Motorola MicroTac Lite XL. It's nearly identical to the one shown previously, which kind of an odd name if you ask me. Light XL, what is it micro? Is it light? Is it extra large? What is it? Name aside, good condition, working. I believe it is equipped with a smaller battery, giving it a more thin form factor, yet lacking in the capacity of some of the other MicroTacs. 
Here we have a Microtag Lite 2. I'm not sure what upgrades they added over the Lite and Lite XL. Again, smaller battery than the Teletac and the America series, but still working. Next, we have a Motorola Microtac 650E Plus. This one is gray with red buttons. Next to it, another 650E Plus. But this one is black, with kind of a teal green color to the buttons. In very good condition. This one has a larger battery. And as for this 650E Plus, this black one here, I have its original box. I believe that is its original box. It is the box it was given to me in, so I'm thinking that's what it came in. But I see now that the phone pictured looks more like the gray one. Not certain if that's just a discrepancy in the box art or if perhaps another Microtech occupied that box previously. Moving on down the line, we have a Motorola StarTac. Still in good condition. Kind of hard to find chargers for these. I believe this one could go both analog and digital. Carriers definitely don't support it today, but would be neat to make a call off of one of these. Here's this one. I cannot remember its model number. It's on Verizon. No obvious name. Can't remember if this was a talk about they might have called this series, but drawing a blank on the name here. I should have had the forethought to write the names down, but here we are. Another similar to this. I don't believe I have its battery installed. It feels kind of light. And the antenna. There was a little bit of wear, but otherwise, not too bad. This one on Nextel, and it is missing its headphone jack cover and has a wobbly antenna. Next we have this one, I believe it is the either the V60 or the V60i. Ah, V60i, right there. It is in working condition. I love the feel of the metal faceplate and battery cover that they are using here. Definitely gave the phone a premium feel. Excellent successor to the StarTac. Here's this one. I believe this was on, yes, Nextel. Some of the Motorola i-series were used on Nextel. Not exactly sure of the age. It does have a bit of cracking there at the hinge. Pretty sure this one is fully operational though. So when you start seeing this proprietary charger that Motorola used in some of its later models. No camera, so I'm thinking that this is either an older device or was meant for business use. And here we have not one but two B170s. This one was one that I had as my first cell phone. This one my grandmother used. Obviously hers got a little less use than mine, therefore is in slightly better condition. These were both on track phone, if I remember correctly. As we come down to the end of the line, here is this one. Can't remember its model number. It is either on Boost or on Nextel. One or the other, one of those Motorola i-series. There's an odd feature in its battery cover. This cover is reflective. I'm not sure why they implemented a reflective battery cover. Were they intending for this to be used like a compact mirror? Was somebody going to be 
applying makeup using their phone's battery cover. I'm not quite certain they're on the intent. Moving on. This chunky one is on Nextel. It was originally covered in this plastic, but that had to come off. It was flaking away. Some of it was sticky. Sadly, a common problem plaguing these older motos, but it is functional. And on to the next row. Another Motorola I series device on Boost. You open it up. And these for Boost and for Nextel were more rugged designed phones, probably intended more for commercial use due to their two-way walkie-talkie type functionality. This one, this one is very interesting. Again, sadly, I cannot remember its model number, but if we look at it closer, we notice that the keypad includes Hebrew characters. Next in line is this Moto, which is sadly suffering from a soft touch degradation. As you can see, I'm not trying to hold it, but it is sticking to my hand. Sadly, these older devices, as they age, this plastic on their housing starts to deteriorate. This one will have to get taken in for an isopropyl bath soon. I'll remove all these affected housing pieces, clean them thoroughly. I'm not sure what's going on with this one's outer display here. Should have probably cleaned these before I made this video. I was so excited to finally lay them all out that I forgot to do so. Otherwise, it's in decent condition if you can stand to touch it for more than 30 seconds, which was already overdoing it for me. Fortunately, this next one, which is the same model, I used a hard plastic and that will not deteriorate over time. So we can get a better look at this. This keypad has worn away at this screen. And I might've made a mistake. These, these are not the same model. They have very similar outer face plates and the battery covers, but their keypads are entirely different. That was my error there. I should have looked at these model numbers a bit closer. Close these up and move on to this one. I believe it is a V540. And it previously had that issue with the soft touch, but I cleaned all the affected surfaces thoroughly with isopropyl, as I discussed doing with this one here. However, I could not get rid of the wear that the keypad has caused on the screen. Its keypad looks very similar to this one. You can see the little iterative changes that they made through the years with these designs. Next are these two. They're exactly the same, so I'll just show you this Verizon one here. Got some type of sticker on there with a number telephone number to call. Decent shape. This next one here, it is, just to show you on Alltel, here I believe this V240 I think. It's when they we're still using a little coaxial charger. I believe this has a mini USB port on it somewhere. Yes, right here. I should have probably put this further back in my line. But as we can see, it does have a mini USB that is used for file transfer. And fun fact, it is hard to open those flaps with one hand. Another one that is plagued by this issue with soft touch, this one on singular, it's not as bad has a headphone jack, a mini USB. This time the mini USB is for charging. You open it up, take a closer look. In pretty good condition, the wear on the screen from the keypad is minimal. 
and we'll continue down the line. Next up is this one. Sadly did not note its model number either. Headphone jack and a mini USB, similar to when we had looked at previous. It does have a little camera. It's on singular. And this is how its keypad looks. Overall is in decent condition. Next, we have this one. Starting to move away from ones that have external antennas. This one has a bit of scuffing on the battery cover. Not sure what happened there. And it appears that that is its headphone jack there. Where is its charging port? Ah, right there. Mini USB. Putting it roughly the same age as these, I would suspect. This one... It's more of an entry-level device on track phone. Not much going on with this one. Charges via this little coaxial port there. Moving on, here we have, I believe, two E815s. This one is in near pristine condition. It has been kept in its box, which is right there. Sadly, it too is experiencing this soft touch deterioration. And this thing is completely mint. Other than that, it is unused. If I were to power this thing up, it would display its number as being all zeros. This one fortunately used a plastic back. However, it did see some use, though it is in very good condition. I'll show you a little bit more on this one, because I don't want to touch that one over there. I hate the feel of that degraded soft touch. It uses this proprietary charging port, which was found on some of the older motos down the line there. And on some of those. And it is in good shape. As we can see, these were fairly popular for their time. Had a relative with one, hence I remembered its model number. And having that one in the, its original box does help there. This one on Nextel. The one that is in the original box there still has its packaging. This is another one just like it. It also charges via mini USB underneath this flap here, which again, hard to open with one hand, so take my word for it. Next is the Motorola L6. I believe this particular one belonged to my stepmother. It's in decent shape. Here's another. These were both on Singular, I believe. This one is unbranded, but I believe it was with either Singular or AT&T at the time. This is a Motorola Z6M on Altel. Oh, and its center button is falling off. And as you can see it has that issue with the soft touch this did not happen previously i've stored them inside i've kept them in a climate controlled and therefore humidity controlled area they've not been exposed to harsh sunlight i'm not certain as to what or, or what causes this process or what i could do to prevent it the only remedy is to bathe the surfaces in isopropyl and scrub this offending coating away. However, you will lose the design here. You will lose the Alltel carrier branding. And 
it no longer feels the same as a newly manufactured Z6M, but that might be a step I have to take. Next here is this one, sharing a kind of brushed aluminum feel on the front with, as I might have mentioned in the previous videos, the Razer V3A and V3XX. Nice to feel, but not good if you got some dirt or debris stuck in it. Lovely phone and does share some design characteristics with the Motorola Razors. Next is the Motorola WX345. It is a lower end, more basic flip phone. I have its original box there. This one was previously used by my grandmother who had the V170 before that. Here's another one. This one, can't remember its model number. It's on Verizon. I believe it is also one of the WX series as it carries some of the same design features and more soft touch. It's not quite as bad. It's not quite as sticky as some of the others, but that's still an ongoing problem. Next, this more rugged unit on AT&T. This hinge is very loose. I imagine it has been flipped closed like that. A lot of people in that time period did open their phones like this. But I personally found that very hard on the hinge and I would just lift it up like that when I was opening my flip phones in that time period. It charges via mini USB has a nice rugged exterior and this phone has clearly seen some things. It was most likely used in a rather harsh environment considering both its condition and the type of phone it is in the first place. Next up are these two. They are the same model, both on Boost. And it switched over to micro USB for charging. I have this little protective sheet I improvised and cut out from a piece of foam that was packaging for some furniture. I use those on some of my flip phones to protect their screens from the keypads. I thought I had removed them all, but I guess I forgot it on this one. Oddly enough, when both of these devices came to me, which they entered my collection several months apart, both of these phones arrived set with Spanish as the language. Good thing I know just enough to navigate the phones. I believe I have kept them both set in Spanish. Here is a Motorola Rival in white. And another in purple, or black and purple, both on Verizon. Love these little Motorola sliders, especially landscape sliders. They are some of my favorites. Next, the Moto U9, the successor to the U6 or Pebble. This one, I believe it charges with micro USB, if I can get this flap open. Again, flaps and one hand don't mix. You look close, yes, micro USB. Funnily enough, this one came preloaded with a mobile version of Need for Speed Carbon. Hearing that soundtrack in a more limited fashion, kind of uh, scaled down for the phone was interesting, to say the least. Did not play it for very long because that does not translate well to a flip phone experience. Next is the VE20 on Altel. It is in excellent condition. Funny story about this one. I got it relatively early in my days as a collector. Heard one of its default ringtones, which was called Precise. 
And that is my current ringtone. And has been for many years. Next is the Crazer K1M on Altel. Suffering from a tiny bit of soft touch degradation. And I believe this one may have a small crack in its screen, but yes, right there. Sadly, hard to pick it up on camera. Not a big enough issue that I'm going to try to replace its front glass or anything. But nonetheless, still a nice little phone. All to prepare us for the next row. All of these Razer V3s. Let me straighten them up a bit and let's move down to the other end to get started. Time for the V3s. Now, I'm not gonna go through all 25 of them here. So, let's just start with this one. It is a Moto V3 on AT&T. The first launch of the Razors here in the States were GSM only. You can differentiate these because they have a flat camera surface there, whereas the later V3Ms and V3Cs had a raised camera bump. These are all V3s. This one on singular. I believe these two are both on singular, but we can check. This one, I think it is on T-Mobile. And this one, yes, AT&T. These are all Razer V3Ms. We can differentiate them from the V3Cs that also have this camera bump. We pop open this battery cover. It has, well, this one looks like it's seen some water damage, but they have this memory card slot here. Not to be confused with the SIM card slot found on the GSM variant. This one can hold an SD card up to 2 gigabytes, if I'm not mistaken. And if we move down to the V3Cs, pop this open. This one does not have that memory card slot. I can get this battery cover back on with one hand. There we go. This one was my old V3C. Unbranded, but it was indeed on Altel. I got it used when I got it. It came with this center button detached, but that did not matter to me. I could still press it, and it was a Motorola Razor. I was practically in love with this phone when it came out. I thoroughly enjoyed the many years of use I got out of it. I, think I held on to it for about four years until I upgraded later on, which I will talk about that in a bit when we get there. These are the V3As, all the way up to that purple one. All of these are on Altel, if I'm not mistaken. There might be one that's on Sprint, but I think they're all on Altel, like this one. This is in excellent condition. Near mint. You might see a little bit of scuffing. It was kept in a case at some point. Again, hard to get little bits of dust and debris out of that brushed aluminum finish that was on these. But worth it. It feels rather nice, in my opinion. And not impossible to clean. Let's move along. It was only these blue ones. Or it was the blue ones and the purple ones that had that brushed aluminum finish. The black ones and the red ones did not. This one's on Altel. And this one is as well. And as is this lovely kind of lilac purple one. You've seen Samsung use a similar color on the S9s, and Apple use a similar color on the iPhone 11s. But Moto did it first with this purple V3A. These are a bit rare, a little bit harder to find. Luckily, I was able to get my hands on that one. 
and it is a lovely edition of the v3 series next come the v3 xx's they are on at&t both of them And these were a slightly upgraded, slightly more premium feeling version. Again, with that finish on the front. These are definitely used with a couple little dings. And scuffs, you can kind of see on the battery cover. Or on this back housing here. But otherwise, both still fully functional. And both excellent little phones. And now both of the Motorola Razr V3i's. I'll show you this one because this one is most likely refurbished. I'll show you real quick. You can kind of see that that sits a bit offset back there from the front housing piece here. It does work. It functions like a normal Motorola V3i. However, we look inside just things look a bit off compared to this red one I have. This one feels a lot more premium. I can tell that they used more metal components here. This one feels a lot more plasticky, a lot more... It just feels cheaper. This one is an authentic Razer V3i. They also have a texture going on in the front. And you can clearly tell the difference in these due to this extended front glass. Instead of having an upraised Motorola logo like these, or having it present here, like the V3XX, they have it up under this front glass, and I believe it lights up when powered on. And now on to Motorola's smartphones. Here we have in front of us the Motorola Q series, or some of them. This was the first Moto Q. as a QWERTY keyboard reminiscent of the Blackberries. They run on Windows Mobile, which was a pretty capable OS at the time, but not the most user-friendly. Next we have what I believe is a Q8 on AT&T. This one is also plagued by this soft touch issue. Not gonna hold it for very much longer. These two are Q9Ms, both on Altel, both in decent condition, both fully working. Do like the green color of this phone. Gives a, a nice, distinct feel. Next, we have the very first iteration of the Motorola Droid. This one it was clearly used, but it was revolutionary at the time. This was one of the first popular Android phones in the U.S. markets. I personally knew a couple people that used them. They were, were quite impressive for their time. 5 megapixel camera, pretty fast processor for their day. All around uh, quite capable for their time. Next, I believe this was the Moto flip side. Had a little trackpad. It also ran on Android, but did not go by the Droid name. On at and as you can see. Can't recall the specs there. Of course, slide-out keyboard with directional keys. Nice little phone for its time. And next we have the Droid 2 Global, which as I might have told you about using that V3C right here, this, this was my next phone. This was the one I personally used, of course, being young, I found some paint and painted the little case. I was thrilled to have this QWERTY keyboard at my fingertips. I could browse the net, I could look up music and research and all sorts of various things. 
It being my first smartphone, I was utterly blown away by the technology, by the speeds of 3G when I was in an area with good reception. The fact that I could store all my music on here and listen to it through this headphone jack, store it in the SD card, just, it was an excellent device for the time and I got, I believe I got about a year and a half to two years of use out of it. Here are several Motorola Admirals. They too have that QWERTY keyboard portrait form factor reminiscent of the Blackberry, but with the classic Android four buttons down here at the bottom. I believe these were more business focused devices. As we come down a bit further, here we have the Moto Droid X2. I had a Droid X at some point, I think. I believe it had some issues and could not be included here with my collection of working devices. Here is where they introduced the dual core processor. as these phones were starting to get a bit more advanced. And as you can see, no physical keyboard on this model as the on-screen keyboard was gaining popularity. Still had the four buttons down here. Had your headphone jack, your power button. Was expandable via an SD card. Was pretty popular for its time as well, if I recall. And next we have the Droid 3 successor to the Droid 2. Here we see the arrival of a dedicated number row, a very convenient feature. Still with the keypad and, and bring back kind of a look from the earlier Droid with the screen that did not fully cover this bottom keyboard here. Left a little bit of space on this side, I guess, to make it easier to hold. That might have been their goal there, but I personally preferred the Droid 2 Global, to where it's a full coverage of the slide assembly here. And I'll show you one with a number row that I did prefer much more. But first, we have to take a look at the Droid Bionic. It was a 4G device. Again, just the touchscreen, no keyboard, nothing like that. Headphone jack is up there. It had an SD card slot and a removable battery. But next in line, the Droid 4. This was what I upgraded to after the Droid 2 Global had served its purpose. It had a number row, full QWERTY keyboard, it was a very, very symmetric, very comfortable typing experience. The camera was good quality for the time. This was the first phone I owned with a front-facing camera as the earlier Droid 2 Global did not have that, if I recall. We'll look at it here closer just to show you. It did have a little notification LED, but no front-facing camera to be had on that device. This one, however, did have it, as well as both micro USB and HDMI. Of course, with the headphone jack, which I spent many hours listening to music with off the Droid 4. Sadly, this is not my original Droid 4, but I do have its box there, as well as the box for the Droid 2 Global. And last but not least, the Droid Razor M. They called these the Razor, as a nod back to the fabled V3 series, and due to its slim form factor, which we can compare. I'll compare it to another Razor M, if you will, V3M. And we can see if I can show this. This is actually a little bit thinner than the original razor, but just by a couple millimeters. But it did lack a removable battery, sadly, as the Droid 4 did as well. They retained the micro 
USB, as well as the micro SD card slot, which was hidden in with the SIM tray. And that's when you started to see Moto shift more towards these non-removable batteries. Of course, no more sliders were manufactured after the Droid 4. They had a couple more devices in that Droid Razor line. The Droid Razor Max HD comes to mind. I have one, but sadly it does not work. But as for the Motorola's, this is my full collection. We'll take a minute to just step back and admire. And these have been acquired over many years of collecting. I started back in 2013, I do believe. And, and at first, my collection only consisted of Motorola's. I branched out from there. I believe I'll cover Samsung next, as they are the company that I'm currently maining. But it has been a pleasure to share this with you all. Sorry if this one ran a little long. I won't keep you any longer. Thank you all for watching. This is Retrocoms signing off.